everybody. Professor Sackett Taylor here with the second half of a video lecture on chapter four, market outcomes and efficiency. So hopefully you just watched the first half of this lecture and this is where we landed. We were looking at how we define market efficiency as the place where total surplus, that is the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus is maximized. I made the argument that the place where this happens, the place where total surplus is maximized and therefore the most efficient place for the market to be operating is in equilibrium. That is to be operating at the point of intersection between supply and demand where quantity demanded is equal to quantity supplied. We introduced last time this idea of operating out of efficiency if we were to be producing and consuming at any, any quantity less than the equilibrium quantity. And we called the amount of loss that's associated with that inefficiency dead weight loss. So this brings us to the next topic where we're going to talk about how taxes actually distort market behavior and market outcomes such that they result in a dead weight loss. So let's just first talk about taxes. We talk up, we pay taxes for a number of things. We pay taxes on our income. We have taxes on property we own. We pay taxes on corporate profits, sales tax, inheritance tax. And primarily, a perp the purpose of these taxes is to raise revenue for society. And that's because as a society, we expect to be provided with certain public services, such as police, military, roads, um, electricity infrastructure, things like that, bridges, right? So things that make our society operate um, better. Let's just, let's just keep it at that for right now. So we need revenue. Those things are not free. And most often we use taxes as a way to raise that revenue and each of us pay a share of what our own personal wealth is towards providing public goods for everyone. Excise taxes are the taxes that I wanna talk about specifically in this lecture. Excise taxes are taxes that are imposed on a particular good or service. Now, excise taxes are not always aimed at raising revenue, although they do raise revenue and we can use those, re those revenues in good ways. Oftentimes, excise taxes are placed on our particular product or service because we are trying to create an incentive in this case, a negative incentive to discourage consumption of that product. So examples that you may be familiar with are taxes on gasoline and taxes on cigarettes. These are each examples of excise taxes that are trying to operate as public policy versions of negative incentives. We want to reduce consumption of gasoline and reduce consumption of cigarettes for the good of public health, environmental health, um, and the way that we can do that is by making these products more expensive. So let's look at how we incorporate the idea of a tax into our supply and demand model. So let's suppose that the government chooses to impose a tax on milk. Now, the question is who's going to pay this tax? The government can choose to levy this tax on consumers or producers. That is, they could collect the tax at the point of sale where a consumer buys the product, or they could collect the tax at the point of, of creation, the point of production where the person is building or putting together or making that product. Tax incidence is going to be a, a, a phrase that we use to describe the burden of the tax on each party. So even if the tax is levied at a particular side of the market, what overall burden does each side of the market carry in terms of the cost of that tax overall? This will be tax incidence. And we're gonna see that tax incidence is shared among both buyers and sellers of a product no matter who the government levies that product on, that is wherever the point of collection is. And we're gonna describe in a second here how that's done. So let's look at the market for milk. Uh, 
On the x-axis, we're measuring quantity of milk in gallons, and on the y-axis, the price of milk per gallon. We have a downward sloping blue demand curve and an upward sloping red supply curve. In this market, with an absence of a tax, we know that the place where we will be operating most efficiently, that is, that produces the most value to society, is to be in equilibrium. This is the point where supply and demand intersect, or in other words, quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal. In this case, in this example, let's assume that that's a $4 per gallon price on milk that produces this equilibrium quantity. Then if the tax was levied on the buyer, that is, if the government came in and said, we're going to collect the tax at the point of sale from the person buying the tax. Well, this now makes this product more expensive for the buyer. So whatever my willingness to pay was before the tax, I now have to lower my willingness to pay for the product itself in order to accommodate the amount of tax associated. For example, if I was originally willing to pay $4 for a gallon of milk, but I now know that I'm gonna be taxed an additional dollar on whatever I pay for milk, then my willingness to pay for the milk itself is gonna be reduced to $3 per gallon because that takes into account that additional dollar of tax to bring me up to the $4 that I'm overall willing to pay. So in this case, if the government was levying a tax on buyers in the amount of $1 per gallon, essentially the way that we model this is to shift the demand curve down by the amount of the tax. And that's because the height of the demand curve, remember, represents a willingness to pay. And if I am now responsible for paying a tax, my willingness to pay, pay for the product will be reduced by the amount of that tax. And so we move the demand curve down by exactly $1 at every quantity point here. Well, what happens? Because my willingness to pay and everyone's willingness to pay is now less, we have a new equilibrium. This new point labeled E2 here is where the new demand curve representing willingness to pay for the product intersects with the supply curve. You can see that this equilibrium represents a lower overall quantity of transactions. That is, whereas before in equilibrium, we were buying and selling a thousand gallons of milk, because of the tax levied on the market, there's going to be a reduction in the number of transactions. And here we see that there's only going to be 750 gallons of milk bought and sold. Now here's where it gets tricky. When there's a tax in the market, there is no longer just one equilibrium price. Essentially, the tax creates a wedge between the price that the buyer pays and the amount that the seller actually gets to keep. So here, that wedge is gonna be the amount of the tax. We can find where that wedge sits by looking at our graphical model. If we consider the new equilibrium as the vertical, um, like a vertical line through the new point of intersection at 750 um, gallons of milk, then we can find that there are actually two prices associated with this quantity. There's the price that the buyer will actually pay. That comes from the original demand curve. And here, that price is $4.50. And then there's the price that the seller actually gets to receive. That's going to be the price the buyer pays less the tax. So here, the seller only gets to keep $350. You can see that what's happened is now the buyer is paying a higher price for a gallon of milk, and the seller is going to get to keep less of it than what they were before. This hurts both sides of the market. Buyers are paying higher prices, sellers are receiving lower prices. The amount of their difference is the tax that's been excised and is gonna be collected by the government. What you see here is that even if the tax was levied on the buyer, there's gonna be a way that, that the cost of that is pushed back on the seller because the people, the consumers who are buying this now have a lower willingness to pay for that product. So overall, we're going to see the seller keeping less of the profit. Let's look at it as if the government had levied this exact same tax, a dollar per gallon, but they were planning on collecting it, not at point of sale, but point of production from the people producing the good, the dairy farmers. Well, now, if a dairy farmer knows that they have to pay a tax for every gallon they produce, 
it becomes more expensive to make their product. And so their willingness to sell that product is going to have to be compensated by that amount of the tax in order to um, take into account this additional cost. So now, since it's a dollar more expensive to produce the milk itself, every individual firm will have a higher willingness to sell, which is a re the resulting in shifting that supply curve upwards by the amount of the tax. So this new supply curve S2 is exactly a dollar higher than S1 at every quantity point. This is compensating for the amount of the additional cost associated with the tax on producers. We now have a new equilibrium point. But what we notice here is that this equilibrium, if we were to draw a vertical line through the equilibrium, occurs at the exact same quantity as the graph that we were just looking at. It reduces the number of overall transactions of milk, the amount of gallons bought and sold from 1,000 gallons down to 750 gallons. And again, this tax creates a wedge between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives. We read the price the buyer pays from the original demand curve and the price the seller receives from the original supply curve. And we can see that these prices are the same as in the model we just looked at. The buyer pays 450 per gallon and the seller only gets to keep 350 per gallon. Buyers are paying higher prices, sellers are keeping less. So again, even though the tax was levied on the seller at the point of production, the seller can push some of the cost of this off towards the buyer by raising the price of their product. So what we learn here is that even when the tax is levied on consumers, some of the burden is passed to producers because the market price is going to fall. On the other hand, if the tax is levied on businesses, the firm will attempt to raise prices to pass some of that burden on consumers. In a competitive market where prices are allowed to fluctuate, we simply alter prices and push them in the direction of the other side of the market to share the burden of the tax. Now, is the burden of the tax always shared um, equally? No. In this example, it was. The burden of the tax was that buyers paid 50 cents more and sellers received 50 cents less. However, it's not always an equal split. It depends really on something called elasticity, but all you need to know is it's related to the slope of the demand curve and the supply curve and which of those two curves is steeper. However, whether it's levied on buyers or sellers, the overall burden will always be pushed off towards the other, resulting in shared tax incidents. That is, each side of the market will pay some portion of the tax. The important piece that links us to the first half of this lecture is dead weight loss. Notice that no matter where the tax was levied, it resulted in fewer overall transactions. We were no longer buying and selling 1,000 gallons of milk. We were buying and selling 750 gallons of milk. This reduction in the number of transactions is like leaving money on the table. The tax has incentivized a reduction in production and both consumption. However, those transactions that are no longer happening or are restricted by the tax would have brought value to the market. And so that loss of value is what we call deadweight loss. A tax is going to hurt both sides of the market. Buyers pay higher prices, sellers receive lower prices. The deadweight loss is the total value of the decrease in economic activity that's caused by this market distortion. So we can look at this deadweight loss graphically as, again, the area of this triangle representing the transactions that no longer happen. In other words, all the transactions to the right of the point in which we're operating stopping at equilibrium. So why don't we get rid of taxes? Well, we still need revenue for public services. So it's a balancing act. Governments have to decide whether they benefit more from a tax or whether it costs them more. In other words, they're looking at the balance between tax revenue and deadweight loss. There's a trade-off here. Every time we raise tax revenue, we also raise deadweight loss. And so, for example, um, in Ireland in 2002, they put a 15 cent tax on plastic bags. This is an excise tax. Just with like with gasoline and cigarettes, the goal is to reduce consumption. 
But by reducing consumption, we also reduce production and that creates a deadweight loss. So they really had to think about whether the loss to society was balanced appropriately by the revenues that they raised and if they met their goal. If their goal was reduction in consumption for environmental reasons, maybe one of the ways that they balance the deadweight loss is looking at gains in terms of environmental preservation. So it's not always a one-to-one -one in terms of dollars. We really have to look at all the ways in which we benefit from a policy and all the ways in which we lose out some things, we give up things, the opportunity cost of a policy. Let's look at some examples. Here's a market with no tax and therefore no deadweight loss. Without a tax and without government intervention, our market will naturally move towards equilibrium to get rid of any surpluses or shortages and to maximize total surplus. However, with a small tax, here let's just assume it's levied at the point of production. A small tax is going to shift the willingness to, to sell of each producer higher than it was before resulting in a reduction in overall quantity of transactions. Here, the tax revenue is associated with the amount of the tax, which is the difference between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller receives. That's the height of this green rectangle. The width of the rectangle are the number of transactions that actually go through, the number of, say, gallons of milk that are sold, each of which has a per unit tax. So when we look at the tax times the per unit or the number of the per unit tax times the number of units that are bought and sold, we get an estimate of our tax revenue. So here, tax revenue is represented by the area of this green rectangle. But the difference between Q2, the quantity that's going to be bought and sold with the tax, and Q1, the quantity that will be bought and sold if there was no tax, that's the area of deadweight loss, the, the here represented by the area of this yellow triangle. So this is a small tax, and we can see that it looks like, at least by estimating visually, here the area of the green rectangle is larger than the area of the yellow triangle. So this would be a case where we benefit more from this tax in the form of revenue than what it costs us in foregone transactions. But what if the tax was a little bit bigger? Well, here, if the tax is bigger, that's going to represent a larger shift of that supply or demand curve, depending on where it's levied, but a larger shift. And so what we find is that tax revenue, well, we should have more tax revenue from a larger per unit tax. But what we also have is a greater restriction on transactions, meaning greater deadweight loss. This is a situation where it's hard really to determine the, um, the relative size of these two things. Are we benefiting more or is it costing us more? Maybe they're very close and there's additional analysis that needs to be done to look at the details of this policy. There is such a thing as too much tax. Eventually, if a tax is so high, it's going to drastically reduce consumption and production to a point in which the tax revenues that you're raising are not enough to cover the amount of loss associated with those foregone transactions. Here's an example of a very large tax, a large shift of that supply curve upwards. And we can see that the green area of revenue is in fact smaller than the yellow area of deadweight loss. This is a situation where there may have been unforeseen um, we couldn't have estimated how much that tax was going to reduce consumption and production. And so we're actually losing out on a lot of value to society as a result of this tax policy. There is going to be actually a thing where the tax is so high that it reduces consumption and production to zero. Um, there's been some examples of this in throughout history, but we really, the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's such, there is such a thing as too big of a tax, and we need to balance the size of that tax and the incentives that that tax now introduces in the form of distorting our ability to reach market equilibrium, because we don't always, we don't want to be in a situation where we're losing more than we're gaining from the results of a policy. The example that we're going to talk about in class is the difference between a smoking tax and a smoking ban.
These are two different policies that have been used differently in different regions of the United States to, with the goal of reducing the consumption of cigarettes. So we're gonna talk about whether this is reducing efficiency in the market by creating too great of a deadweight loss and which would be more effective at reaching the goal that the policy is intended to reach. Do we want a tax or a ban or potentially even something else? We're gonna do a Lincoln style debate in class about these two things and really examine all different sides of each, of each argument. So in conclusion, when a market is unregulated, meaning governments are not intervening in mar on market prices, then we can benefit from generating the greatest total surplus by landing ourselves in equilibrium. When we tax specific goods, excise taxes, we introduce a situation that distorts the market and restricts transactions from happening. This results in a deadweight loss reflected in a reduction to overall economic activity. Society needs to choose how to balance the benefits of government services that taxes pay for and the cost associated with creating inefficient market activity. What is the end goal? Is the goal efficiency always, or are there other goals? I'm gonna put an uh, idea into your head right now that perhaps one of the goals of public policy is not efficiency, but equity, redistributing resources so that we take care of the people who are most disenfranchised. What would those kind of policies look like? And how do we balance the cost of such policies associated with the loss from reduced transactions? There's a lot to think about here. I encourage you to go back and look at these graphs and think about examples from your own life. I know you've seen things on television, heard it on the radio, talked about it with your friends and family. We Taxes are everywhere. And so where are taxes an appropriate policy mechanism for achieving our goals? And what are those goals? So we'll talk about this more. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.